Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm Tony LeBlanc and today I'm in conversation with James Lancaster, Managing Director of Alderney Electricity. James is going to take a look at COP26 and update us on current matters affecting Alderney. Then we'll take a look at future energy options. Good to see you. Hello, Tony. It's lovely to see you again. It's been six months. Here and we you're, are again. And you're here on the rock. I am. I am. I'm in my sort of temporary office in Alderney. So you can tell from the uh, wonderful decor, the wonderful wallpaper and the lighting that this hasn't been decorated for the last 30 years or so. So, but it's, um, it's, it's retro. It's nice. I like it. It's OK, <laughs> isn't it? That's, you know, it's a yeah. roof over your head. Let's, let's start off with COP26. Um, yeah. You know, it didn't seem to achieve that much in my view. Um, um, the one I, and I a half. Fascinated. You, are, you asked me to have a look at it because uh, yeah. actually I've been largely utterly uninterested in COP26. Yeah, <laughs> it was your problem that forced me to actually at least have a think about it and, and what they're you know talking about there. Yeah. So, so com COP, Conference of the Parties to the UN Convention on Climate Change. Uh, COP1 occurred in Berlin in 1995, um, where they were just sort of getting together and getting to know each other and just chatting about stuff. The first important meeting they had was, I think, COP3, which was Kyoto, and that was, I'm going to say, 1997. Okay. From which came the Kyoto Protocol. Well, that was all about looking at how they might reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. And so it's the first point really where um, actions to address climate change were on the agenda. Um, the next milestone was 99, which was the Copenhagen meeting. Uh, I'm just trying to think, COP15, I think Copenhagen was, yeah. in 2009. Um, that's where the two degree temperature rise target by the end of the century came in. That was largely in response to things like the Stern report, which was produced in 2006, which was looking at um, or, or trying to use the first report looking at some of the science in the area and as um, and what the science actually meant in terms of climate change and what the scale of the problem actually was. Um, already by that stage, in my view, there was a lot of political, um, you know, sort of greenwashing going on. Two degrees itself, I think the science was already saying that if we continued on the trajectory we were on with targets and everything, that the rise was going to be significant, significant more than two degrees. Um, but Stern made certain assumptions, uh, for example, that the greenhouse emissions would peak in around 2015, 2016 and reduce thereafter. Um, and of course, they haven't. No. You know, they are still, still rising. They had a little blip with COVID, and that's interesting. We should, we should probably reflect upon that. But they are still rising. Um, the... So wind that forward to 2015 COP 20 something, 23, 23 21. 21. Um, and that's where the Paris um, Accord became the Paris, uh, sorry, the Copenhagen Accord became the Paris Treaty. And that's when uh, the target was modified to well below sort of two degrees centigrade and ideally one and a half. Um, again, you know, I think really by that stage, the cat was out of the bag. There were a lot of, I, I think by, by 2015, it, it was recognised that it was, it was politically unpalatable to suggest that temperature rise might be any more than two degrees. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, interesting. So, so you know, yeah. so that's the background. That's where we are. And we've yeah. come to COP26 in 2021, um, where they have been saying, all right, we do need to limit this to, you know, one and a half degrees. But of course, a lot of that was scuppered by the Indians saying, well, we're not going to be able to actually make a significant reduction in our emissions. You know, well, ours won't be before 2017. Um, you know, or whatever it is, or, or you know, we're not going to hit our targets before 2017. Um, you know, we had all the action of particularly the US uh, fossil fuel lobby, um, which we know has caused dilution of the actions proposed under um, COP26. But this is this is the political reality of the world that we live in. There are lots yeah. of different lobbies and lots of different parties. There are lots of different factors to consider, and so it, you know, it takes 
uh, flash to bag in the in these spaces is enormously long really mm. Mm. And so it's hardly surprising that the more active climate change protesters get more and more agitated with the more and more conferences that they have. Yeah. Now, very interestingly, you uh, put me on to uh, a, a lecture <laughs> given by uh, Kevin Anderson of yep. the Cabot uh, Institute. That was in 2012. And um, he was saying at that point, if he got up to 4%, it would be absolutely devastating. And, uh, yeah, 40, 40 degrees. Yeah, and, and we're going back nine years on this one. Correct. Uh, I, you know, I was, I was fascinated because, again, when you put the challenge out to say, you know, can you, let's have a chat about sort of COP26 and where we are and what flows from that. I thought, you know what, actually, let me go and revisit um, Kevin's lecture. So at the time I was working at the University of Bristol and was industrial liaison for uh, Bristol University's Cabot Institute, which is the university's climate environmental institute um, others were already active in climate change we didn't do a huge amount in climate change um, but it's all obviously layered into the whole thing one of the big centers on climate change is the Tyndall center in manchester which is where kevin anderson comes from yeah yeah from. yeah now I invited him down to give the annual lecture i sat with my mouth open really listening to what he had, had and said, if anybody's interested, um, it, it, I, I would suggest if you're really interested in this topic, Kevin's listening to Kevin's lecture is a worthwhile hour of your time. You can find it on YouTube. Just Google Kevin Anderson Cabot Institute. That's as in John Cabot. Yeah. C A B O T. All right. Um, and it, I, you know, if you're interested and you want want a come down with the science, I was it's, interested because this is nearly ten years ago. Kevin gave this yeah, lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting um, and easy to watch. It's very, very interesting, easy to watch. The fact yeah. the the science is very clear, um, very um, well presented. Um, it's well argued, and it, but I, I think what was in, is most important to me is Kevin is not an eco warrior. So he's not he's not coming at this from an angry point of view. He's just simply saying that this is the science. This is what's yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And here, he, here, are, here are the numbers. Take it or leave it. Here's my yeah. interpretation. Yeah, he, and I he, think he made the, the point. Title, he, yeah. Made, made the point actually that fossil fuel had doubled between 1980 and 2012 and you know yeah. it's a very short space of time to actually double up isn't it well indeed and i think you know we're pushing towards another doubling over the last decade aren't we you know, yeah because of the amount of coal particularly that is being burnt in indian china at the moment um, the, as they as they push this industrial um you know the, the expansion that they're looking at the economic expansion they're looking mm. for yeah. And, you know, I, I, I was also reminded of a talk that was given at the Blue Islands Conference that we held in Alderney a few years back. Um, and one of the talks by one of the presenters were, there was to say that um, he, the premise is his talk was that sustainable economic growth was an oxymoron. Yeah. Yeah. The two don't work. Um, and so part of, um, you know, what Kevin's conclusion was in his 2012 lecture was that if we really, really wanted to limit global temperature rise to uh, two degrees, and those were the targets under Copenhagen back in 2012, um, that what we were at, what the world was looking for was actually a planned economic recession. Mm. And he first used those phrase, that phrase in 2007 as a response to the Stern report. So that mm. was, he first used that phrase um, Pre, uh, pre Copenhagen, and in fact, now if you look at it ten years on, this is actually what Extinction Rebellion and others are asking for. They're asking for a, a planned eco um, economic recession. Well, and of course, the the um, Kevin, Kevin's um, the interesting part of Kevin's uh, talk is he was saying, "Well, that's all well and good for the OECD, you know, the developed countries." But it's a little bit fair on the developing countries who are simply trying to attain the same standards of living that we have, isn't it, surely? Yeah. And so if we prioritise um, their growth in terms of global carbon budget, what does it actually leave for the rest of us? And the answer mm. is nothing. And, and the fact of the matter is that really we, the West, the North of the globe, et cetera, et cetera, are responsible for it up to a point because of our insatiable yeah. desire to buy things that, primarily are manufactured in China and yeah. are, you know, subject to electricity generated by coal. 
So, yeah. so we are indirectly involved in this, and I think no, no, yeah, we've got to put our hand up so. to that one. Yeah, no, very, very, very much so. And, and the simple fact of moving manufacturing overseas and over to other parts of the world doesn't actually change it. This is a global no. phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the <laughs> other thing, of course, that uh, Kevin Kevin mentioned in his lecture, he was looking at fuel emissions uh, from yeah. cars, and. Yeah. He, you know, sort of said, well, based on the figures provided by the manufacturers, um, you know, things are going to improve. But we then subsequently found out in 2015 that the whole thing was a fake. They yeah. were fiddling the emission figures, all of the car manufacturers in the world. And as a result of that, you know, that sort of... Um, destroyed Kevin's point in my, in my view. <laughs> it did really. And I, you know, this is why I was fascinated just to revisit that. You know, I think it's probably enough on, on Kevin's book, but why I was fascinated to, re to revisit it was it was nearly 10 years ago and he made some assumptions. And I just I thought, well, actually, you know, thinking about it, what were his assumptions like? And actually they were massively conservative. Yeah, yeah. But yeah already the yeah. picture he was painting is actually quite dramatic. But if you yeah. look at it, I mean, he, he accepted the fact. He said, right, well, let's just assume that emissions will peak in 2000. Um, yeah. 15, 16, and of course they haven't. They were still rising. There has been a drop just recently because of COVID, but what COVID has done is COVID has actually kicked off a global recession. Mm. So you can actually see with a direct hand that that is exactly the kind of intervention that is required to pull um, the, these emissions down. Um, the other thing I think which is important to, to, to note is that the political rhetoric tends to couch these targets in terms of the absolute amount of emissions at any one time. But I think the, the important thing to recognize is actually that's not really what's important because carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are cumulative. Mm. So we're sat having a chat, we are exhaling carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, just sat here being, we, we're using computers, we use electricity. I've got the lights on, we're burning diesel down at the power station. Um, CO2 is going into the atmosphere as we speak, and that CO2 will stay in the atmosphere for the next 100 years. Yeah. Do you, do you think various governments have got any idea as to the actual cost of decarbonisation? Uh, no, not really. Um, I think the... Uh, the... I think they, they understand that it is a staggeringly large figure. Yeah. I think the um, I think there is still inevitably a hope that technologies will come along over the next decade or two that will put this all within our reach because we still don't know how to do it. Not really. So we're talking about nuclear fusion, aren't we? Well, yeah, we're talking about fusion as opposed to fission. Yeah, um, you yeah. know, and ultimately, that has always been the um, you know the goal for clean energy. Yeah. If we can yeah. replicate how the sun does it directly on the earth, we are you know we're home and dry really. But it is incredible, James, how governments lose the plot. Swansea Bay tidal lagoon. That was an <laughs> obvious one, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think so. Uh, you know, again, when I was over, when I was over in Bristol, we were doing a lot of tidal work on energy, and you know, that was you know, when I came back again, nearly a decade, and Swansea Bay Lagoon was on the uh, list at that point. We were looking at a number of tidal lagoons in um, uh, actually in the Severn Estuary, and the reason for that was it was a response because nobody locally wanted the other project to go ahead, which was to build a bloody great wall between Lavernock Point near um, south of Penarth near Cardiff mm. over to Brian Down. Mm. Um, and, I, you know, I think everybody, everybody locally, um, you know, whether it was industrialists, uh, you know, the, the, the local councils, the environmentalists, bearing in mind the places like Slimbridge and the Wetlands and Wildfowl Centre are up in sort of Gloucestershire, further up the Severn. I think you know, everybody was united under one thing. That was about the last thing that we wanted to happen. Um, right. So it was an interesting time. And we thought lagoons were the obvious thing to do. And the Swansea Lagoon seemed like an obvious, obvious thing to do. If you look at the regeneration that's happened around Cardiff, uh, since they built the wall around Tiger Bay, then it seems like a bit of a no-brainer. And if you're going to generate tide, tidal energy, the one where um, actually it makes economic sense because it is a byproduct, really, is around tidal lagoons. Mm, mm, mm. 
Anyway, so this... um, yeah, it would have been nice to see it go ahead, but, yeah. but you know, I think uh, unfortunately, it, all these things get caught up in the politics. Yeah. Um, the you know, and the reality of the of the price of energy influences these things massively. And at the moment, you know, it is anticipated in the next contracts a difference. The strike price of offshore wind is going to be around about fifty pounds per, um, you know, megawatt hour, and mm. that's about as cheap as you can generate electricity mm. at the mm. moment. Mm. And so, so anything to do with tidal or wave or other, um, you know, modalities at the moment, or hydrogen or anything like that, is being overshadowed by the cost reductions in wind and solar. Okay, let's let's now get on to AEL itself. Um, another yep. director, a new director, Alan Bates, who's also the um, MD of Guernsey Electricity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and of course, uh, Guernsey Electricity do have a shareholding in AEL, don't they? Well, the states of deliberation have a shareholding. Yeah. Let's, let's be yeah. clear. Not okay, sorry. You know, it's, it's all, it, it, well, it's all the same thing. It's like yeah. states of Alderney yeah. own um, 78%. Yeah. States of um, deliberation own eighteen percent, and others own about just under five percent. Yeah. The um, in fact, the eighteen percent stake was uh, the Guernsey have was the same stake that States of Alderney took back in the fifties, but it wasn't until the Christie brothers um, sold out their stake, which was about sixty percent in the sort of mid to late seventies, that States of Alderney jumped up to seventy eight percent. So states of deliberation, Guernsey have been in there from day one, really, because uh, the company needed capitalisation and both states of ordinary and states of Guernsey put money in. Not a huge amount, but enough to get them going. Uh, do you think there are synergies with Guernsey Electricity to be had? Yeah, of course there are. Mm. Yeah. Of course there, there are. I mean, I, I'll give you an example at the moment. Um, you know, so um, third, Thursday this week, um, a couple of the en uh, engineers and their health and safety manager are coming over from Guernsey Electricity to do a peer review. Mm. Um, the, so they're just going to spend some time with our teams and have a look at how we're doing things and make recommendations on how we might improve our, um, you know, our practices around health and safety. Mm. It's not to say there's anything wrong, but no. you know, that's the kind of thing that we can do where they have got, uh, you know, there are much more... Um, larger organization and they are therefore actually have resource available to them that we struggle to find yeah and, and so, obviously james a hell of a lot cheaper than employing consultants yeah of course it is yeah of course it is so that's got to make um, sense you know, we, isn't will, it? we we will pay them for their time of course yeah, we sure. will because yeah. they're actually providing value but we're not yeah. paying yeah. consultancy rates we're yeah paying sort of hourly rates of um, you know, electricity company staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how are you getting on with the tariff reform? Uh, I mean, the tariff reform is all, all wrapped up with the, uh, you know, the policy work that the states are doing. That I, 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 I noticed you put that on your list. I am not a member of that committee. Um, Matt Birmingham sits on that committee for uh, AEL at the moment. So I get a little bit of feedback, but I'm, mm. at the moment I am deliberately staying fairly aloof from it. Um, I chat to Bill and others and Alex and others as I see them, um, but I remain reassured that progress is moving forward. They're having regular meetings. They are getting their heads around, you know, <laughs> it sounds like stupid questions, but they're really important. What's the difference between policy and strategy and action? So again, what's the difference between policy and strategy and action? These, these are important <laughs> questions that we need to tease out if you're going to come up with policy. Yeah, um, okay. And I think, and I think they've got their head around that, and so they are now starting to progress forward, as far as I can tell, in a, in a really sensible direction. Yeah. I am hopeful that not before Christmas, but shortly after Christmas, I will start to get feedback from that group in terms of where they're going with it, and then we get into an iterative process because they say, "All right, well, you know, we'd like our policy to look like this," and at that point, I can respond to say, "Okay, but well, if we're going to do it like that, these are the options you've got ahead of you." Yeah. So, so. We then move on to the next level about how they shade those top level policy requirements in terms of actual action and to support behaviours. Uh, but I think it's important for me at that point, because what we do need to tease out of this is what is the role of AEL going forward and what's its relationship going to be with the community in the States? What is our role as a company going to be in terms of meeting these challenges going forward? Mm, mm. Um, but and I think that's really important. As part of that, 
what we then do is we then look at things like the regulatory model and we say, well, actually, is the concession law um, still valid? Yeah. The concession law works, but it was written in 1953. It's hopelessly outdated. It's not. It's not really for, fit for purpose. Whilst it's still functional, it's not fit for purpose when we consider what's coming down the pipeline. So we need to change that. And, and as part of that, we move into tariff reform. And I think yeah. the one thing that we are all agreed on is the tariff reform is necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how about power consumption on the island? Is that still on the wane? No, it's actually gone up recently because, of, it, 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 again, it's a, you know, it's a bizarre thing. But obviously, with COVID, COVID, with, with, COVID with people staying here, um, with uh, our friends from the neighbouring islands not able to travel as far afield as they like, a lot of them have actually done their staycations by coming up to Albany, have loved it so much they've bought property and, and, you know, and are now spending a significant amount of time up here. So actually, our energy consumption has taken a bump back up. We're now back up to 2010. Right, OK. Um, oil prices obviously have uh, gone up considerably since they were giving away West Texas oil. Yes. Um, how, how does that fit in with the uh, surcharge that you put on the bill in terms of the oil, the energy cost? Uh, well, I mean, I'm just actually looking at the figures because we just had the invoice through in the last sort of, um, sort of 24 hours or so. Yeah. We are looking, so between the last ship and this ship, we have seen a 12 pence per litre price increase. On wow. Average. Yeah. So at the moment, we are, so we were previously paying about 34, 35 pence. We're now up to about 46 pence. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you convert that back into electricity, the, um, fuel cost component which is just which is just a figure that we publish um and and it's it, it's an element of the bills but the reason we do it like that is so that we have actually have a very direct measure of the cost of the fuel that we are burning to produce each unit of electricity yeah. at any one time mm. um, and so that's the fuel cost component is a function of the absolute price of the you know the landing costs of the diesel but also the efficiency that we can achieve at the power station um, so efficiency gains have dragged it down, fuel prices pushing it back up again. It was 15 point two before the last um, boat. Uh, it's now gone up to 17.8. Yeah. So we will have seen a two and a half pence hike in the price of electricity just on fuel alone. Yeah. There's nothing we yeah. can do about it. No, well, that's right. You know, um, captive to the uh, the, mar um, the world markets, aren't you, essentially? Um, Absolutely captive to the markets and absolutely captive to the supply chains. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's going on with Simec Atlantis? Because there was uh, an article in the Telegraph a few weeks ago, which gave the impression that, you know, some, some things were not quite as we'd hoped they'd be. Uh, the, well, I, th I think, it, it, I mean, I, I, there was a piece, I think last week's journal, more to put a piece in, he asked me to comment, so there's some comments from me on this. I think, you know, the, the, uh, he's gone. You there, James? Um, yeah, I'm still here. We, dropped, just, we dropped back briefly there, didn't we? Yeah, I've just done a commercial break. Yeah, <laughs> but the um, my, my computer told me recording was still in progress, yeah. so we're still going. That's good. Um, Simon so Atlantis, I, the I think the thing to remember, which everybody needs to bear in mind, is that there are different types of company which embody different amounts of risk. Mm. Okay, Simec so Atlantis is a technology development company. Yeah, they are by definition at the riskier end, business risk and financial risk at the end of companies. Um, they are a publicly listed company on the AIM market. The AIM market is a market for younger, riskier companies. Mm. Um, I think there is an argument that says that actually even a company like Simec probably aren't ready for the risk profiles that even AIM implies. Mm. Uh, but like a lot, or like all technology development companies, and bearing in mind, I spent the 12 years before coming to Alderney working in technology development and raising money for technology development companies. So I kind of know how it works. If you are in a technology business, you are only as good as the money you've got in your bank at any one time. And therefore you are permanently fundraising. Yeah. Now I think what has happened with, you know, so what's happened with Simec Atlantis is the, um, you've had all this issue with the Gupta family group. Yeah. Who, uh, 
and and the green sill um you know issues that we had there and so uh, at one level Simic Atlantis is just looking at a a company which owns 43 percent of their stock having difficulties yeah that doesn't create an automatic linkage necessarily between the two um because it's like you know people own stocking companies and they sell stocking companies and it doesn't necessarily affect the underlying business that to, to some extent the trading stock operates in a different market than the company itself mm. But inevitably, there are links between the two, particularly with um, early stage development companies. And so I think what, what came out was that the auditors had flagged certain concerns about commitments, uh, future commitments between the two, yeah. which may, may now not be available. Now, in practice, all that, that means is that Simec Atlantis if they're not going to get the funds that they were expecting to get through GFG at some point in the future, need to find money from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, I was banging the table there. That might have come through. I didn't mean to. Running parallel, um, running parallel with a, this. But, but the point is, it's a function of their life. It's what yeah, they sure. do. As a yeah, yeah. But where, where do the French now fit in on it? So I don't, because the French have not announced where they are with um, subsidy regimes, the French yeah. government. Uh, so we're still, at least I haven't seen any announcement of that front, but I think, you know, the French are more than occupied um, around the argument over uh, migrants and fishing and yeah. other things at the moment. So I suspect um, COP26 and their own problems. So I think they've got more to worry about than um, renewable energy feeding towers right now. But the, but the great hope as far as the French were concerned was that they would actually construct the equipment um, in the Cherbourg area. As, yeah, as, as part of the deal. Absolutely right. And that is very much a sort of on the regional political agenda. Yeah. Of course, um, you know, the, 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 the Normandy government, or more specifically, the La Manche government, Cherbourg Peninsula government, um, you know, did encourage and secured investment into facilities in Cherbourg for do, doing just that. Yeah. And, you know, over the last, well, how long has it been now? Five years? Um, you know, those, those, facilities have not been utilized anything like to the extent they have they were hoping and so uh you know they need projects like this to go ahead yeah i think the focus is more on the offshore offshore wind projects that they're looking at um, mm. you know along the northern french coast because that's where the volume is going to come from in the short term um, but time is part of that because we do have this you know we do live this island in particular as we know is sat in this Highly energetic area. Mm, yeah, very much so. Um, so, so it, it's not off the agenda. It's not yeah. on the agenda. There are all sorts of problems, but I, I think the, you know, thing that people bear in mind is any project like this being delivered by a company like uh, Simec Atlantis carries a lot of risk. And I think it's the the interesting thing from my perspective is that AEL is a utility company and therefore we don't do risk yeah sure yeah, yeah it's yeah. one of the things that i've had to get my head around coming out of a very risky industrial environment into a very low risk environment what that actually means in terms of my personal propensity for risk yeah but yeah what it means is that if we end, end up doing a deal with an organization like cymec atlantis we have to do it in such a way that all of that risk is mitigated yeah, sure. I, I, we do that I, I, through I warranties and insurances yeah, and others. Yeah, but originally it was all about the strike price, wasn't it? Yep. In, in terms of the viability of the thing. Um, yep. Bearing in mind the fact that oil has gone up again, uh, if, if they were to sort of come along tomorrow and say we're ready to go, would it work in terms of the strike price? Not today, but I mean, you know, again, it's, it's this projection. Or it, well, if we were, if we, if they came along to say we're ready to go on those terms, which were forced by the heads of terms, um, there is a discussion to, to be said and say, all right, look, you know, we're now probably up at sort of variable cost seventeen point eight. So we're probably pushing up towards nineteen pence now in terms of mm. our variable cost of generation. That's nearly the twenty pence in the strike price. Yeah. So we, Term, that would mean a increase yeah yeah but in the long term, it, it's you know, closer it, than it was it's a lot closer than it was yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah i mean we're seeing the highest oil prices that we've seen since 2013 now 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, interestingly, 2014, I was saying, well, the oil price is just going to keep going up, isn't it? And of course it doesn't. Every time I say that, it goes down again. So, um, <laughs> well, let us know and we'll take some options. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's fine. In, in another couple of weeks, I'll the price is going up and then, you know, that's fine. We'll have, we'll have a bet on it at that point, Tony. Going back internationally now, JCB agreement with for a ten percent stake with Fortescue Future Industries, yeah. green hydrogen. Does that sound good? I think so. Um, yeah. I, 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 it sounds brilliant to me. Uh, yeah, what they're talking about: fifteen billion tons of green hydrogen output by twenty thirty. Um, I have long been expecting hydrogen to be the technology that you know got us over the hump that we needed before anybody, the scientists might stand some chance of coming up with a, you know, a workable fusion reactor or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Because hydrogen is, you know, at at its, um, you know, when when you're talking about the combustion of hydrogen or using hydrogen in fuel cells, you are talking about um, hydrogen and oxygen getting together to form water. Yeah. So it is low carbon technology, absolutely low carbon technology. And green is good, blue is not so good. Is that right? Yeah, well, you've got, you've, so you've got three types of hydrogen. You've got so-called grey hydrogen, you've got blue hydrogen, and green hydrogen. Mm. So uh, uh, grey hydrogen, that's sort of classically what you do, and but that's making hydrogen from, primarily from methane, from hydrocarbons. Um, and so if you combine methane with steam, under heat at heat under pressure with a nickel catalyst a reaction occurs that produces hydrogen and carbon monoxide yeah okay um now that's blue that's green gray hydrogen sorry blue hydrogen simply means that you've got carbon capture processes in place that all of that carbon monoxide which ultimately gets converted into well either carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide as a um as greenhouse gases get captured and stored yeah. So if you can store, and, and typically, you know, storage levels 70, 75%, something like that. So you've, 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 you've reduced the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from your process by about 75%. Yeah. Um, and that's what we call blue hydrogen. It's still putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, so that's what we call blue hydrogen. Green I'm- hydrogen is where you take renewable energy and you use an electrolysis process simply to separate water. Yeah. That is, that is absolutely low carbon. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. the way to go. That, that's a good stuff to have, no expensive. doubt about that. Now, what about biodiesel? It's a good start. Um, bio, I mean, bio, the, 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 so biodiesel is, I'm going to say biodiesel is good up to a point Lord Copper. Yeah. So uh, what I mean by that is that you also need to, you need to, in, in terms of biofuels, do you remember it's this, this carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a hundred years? Yeah. So if you are using short cycle crops, things like eucalyptus and other things like that, which actually grow rapidly and actually produce quite a lot of material, then all right, you turn, you, you, you take the oils from that, you turn it into diesel, you, um, you know, burn that diesel as biodiesel, it puts carbon into the atmosphere, but those crops rapidly sequestrate that carbon, you know, back into more crop. So they're sucking it back. So they're sucking it back in. So right. um, whilst it whilst in the in immediate is pushing, um, you know, What's the immediate burning it is putting um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Yeah. Actually, the, the crops with which you are making that biodiesel suck that carbon dioxide back. So you say, oh, well, okay, that's fine because that's a carbon neutral at that level. Yeah. It's not quite, it's never going to be quite, but it's good. It's better than what it's better than fossil fuels. Where mm-hmm. biodiesel goes wrong is if you're using things like palm oil and not, you know, chopping down trees, yeah. Trees Deforestation, to, yeah. yeah. Um, palm oil to make biofuels yeah so it's going back to the amazon isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so um so so really i think bio bio biofuels are really interesting but there's biofuels and there's biofuels yeah yeah and and again 
they are, I would say they are an important, they are not the answer. They are an important part of transition. Yeah. 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 And th- this is really what it's all about, James. It is transition is the operative word, isn't it? As far as the whole thing's concerned, it's not going to yeah. happen overnight or anything like um, that. No, that's my, um, view. that's my view. Uh, coming on to mini nukes, Rolls Royce getting on underway with their <laughs> modular reactor takes up yeah. two football pitches apparently. Yeah, but it can power a million homes. Yeah. So you know that that's got to be a, a much quicker fix, surely, than building new new I, nuclear stations. Yeah, yeah. Department of Energy and Climate Change, when they still existed, um, go again probably going back a decade or so now, actually had. I think I mentioned this to you before. They came up with an app. They had well, it was an online game you played, yeah. where they let you manage the UK's energy system, and you could build power stations, and you could stick up wind farms, and you could, you know, reduce yeah. industrial output, and you could build new homes, and all these sorts of things. And it's quite interesting to play with because whatever you did, you could build as many wind farms as you want. But you, you couldn't balance the equation <laughs> because of those days when the wind wasn't blowing or the sun wasn't shining, yeah. and you had to yeah. you had to produce energy. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there was only back, there was only one button that would really balance the equation. That was building more nuclear power stations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, conventional yeah. nuclear power stations take a long time to build, a long time to come online. So when mm. people go and like Rolls Royce and say, "Oh, we're knocking out nuclear poles all the time with submarines and things like that," why don't we just build a slightly bigger one, but we'll do it modular? Yeah. Um, so, so you know, it's flat pack nuclear power station. Still, still, a, still, a one and a half billion quid's worth, I think, at the last count. <coughs> but it means you can build them quicker and you can get them into production. So we won't be having one um, of those too soon. No, no, no. Well, and we're talking sort of 2030 before I think the, um, you know, they're going to be properly, when, yeah. before it's going to be yeah. all sorted yeah. out. But the point yeah. being, once they're into production, they, in theory, they can knock out nuclear power stations really quickly. Yeah, yeah. And um, did you, did you which, see that? Which again, it's, it, it's a transition thing, bear in mind, because there is only, a, there's a finite amount of fissile material available mm. on the planet it's very expensive to produce and it will get used up eventually yeah and the more nuclear power stations we build the quicker we'll yeah you know yeah. we'll use it up and, and this goes for a whole range of things including batteries for electric cars is not unlimited what what's the uh, prime mineral they use for uh, uh in, well, for batteries? Yeah, I mean, mostly lithium, they're mostly lithium iron yeah yeah um, well, that, there's that's... lots of rare and other things involved in the production. And yeah. so, you know, mostly mostly those are being sort of dug out of open cast mines in China, which are using yeah. coal fired power stations yeah. to power the machinery. Yeah. So, you know, like a lot of these debates, you don't have to go very far back along the supply chain before you start playing the, playing the game. How green is my green technology? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but all of these things are, you know, we need to, we, we need to be very clear about. Those technologies which are primary causes of climate change, mm-hmm. or those industries, or however you want to couch that term, and what we can do about to reduce the impact of those industries, we need to be very clear about low carbon technologies that are not neutral, are not renewable, and that includes nuclear, and we need to be very clear about renewable technologies. Yeah, so yeah. Because hydrogen is, is renewable. So it all comes back to wind and tide and solar. Wind and tide and solar until you can actually until you can actually fundamentally harness the power of the sun. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James, I think we're gonna have to conclude at this point, but can I thank you very, very much for all your time spent and all yeah. the res- and all the research you did. And <laughs> And um, I'll put, uh, I sent, sent through a little notification to our um, viewers and I'll put a note of um, Kevin Anderson's lecture. I'll put oh, the link thanks. If you, put the, if you put the link there, that would be yeah. really good. Because I think yeah. there are a lot of people who, um, for whom it would prove a very, very interesting hour well spent. Yeah, yeah, yeah very much so. Anyway, good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Really um, good to see you. Don't expect, expect we'll see you again on the show until the new year, but uh, there we are. Well, let's, I, I suggest what, what we do is let's let's wait until there is some some white smoke from the uh, energy policy group, and then we'll come back and have a chat about it. That, that sounds like a very good idea. Thanks, James. Thank you. You're right.